This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st Century. by the grace of God. Excellent. And, you know, we're here today because we want to talk about what recently came out. Uh, Sheriff David Clark Jr. of Milwaukee County up in Wisconsin said some interesting things about the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. He actually called him a son of Lucifer. And I just want to get your response about that assessment by uh, Sheriff Clark, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, Brother Ronald, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your platform with us. We're very honored to be with you and the loyal subscribers to your YouTube channel once again. Uh, unfortunately, we are together once again uh, in the aftermath of controversy, but uh, this is controversy that is born out of the ill-advised comments of uh, Milwaukee's top cop, uh, Sheriff David Clark, uh, whom uh, we respect his position uh, as the chief law enforcement officer for Milwaukee County. Uh, but we forthrightly uh, disagree with his false characterization uh, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, a man who is beloved uh, in the black community. He is beloved all over the world among Africans in the diaspora, among oppressed peoples. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan recently returned to America from a historic visit to the Middle East where he visited the Islamic Republic of Iran. And there he was received and welcomed uh, during the 37th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. So uh, when you go around and you talk about a man that is much beloved and respected as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, then it becomes the duty of all of us who have benefited from the minister's ministry from his guidance, from his tutelage and his instruction, and from his example of being a strong and courageous black man, it becomes our duty to lift our voices uh, and to utilize the truth, facts to refute the charges uh, that are false uh, and uh, are leveled against our beloved minister. Uh, what is intriguing about Sheriff Clark's commentary is that it reminds us of something that you read about in the scriptures when Jesus was going around and he was performing many different miracles and he was raising the dead, he was giving sight to the blind, he was healing the man with the withered hand. And in the aftermath of all of the great things that Jesus did in scripture, some offered that he did these wonderful things by the power of Beelzebub, which is a, a title for the devil. And my mind certainly was reminded of that listening to Sheriff Clark's uh, ill-advised and false comments about our minister. Uh, what was fascinating though is that many times when the minister gives a very long message, maybe two or three hours, you find the media and you find critics seizing upon various aspects of the minister's message while ignoring the most important parts of the minister's message. And it was fascinating to me that the sheriff, who was a law enforcement officer, sought to step outside of his discipline and to be a popular culture critic, if you will, because he was responding to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's statement made during his Savior's Day address that if there were law enforcement agencies around the country who refused to provide our sister Beyonce a police protection on her tour, that the men of the Nation of Islam would happily uh, support our sister with security personnel to make sure that she had the freedom to express herself, to express her love and solidarity for her people, 
and to uh, add her name to the list of many artists and entertainers who are now seeing their vital role in a cultural revolution as activists and those who must put out a positive uh, reaffirming message for our people. Uh, but what was again, uh, I thought a missed opportunity for the sheriff was for him to weigh in on the minister's commentary about how the city of Detroit and its police chief Craig, uh, who the minister mentioned that was a good man and who had supported the Nation of Islam's presence in the city of Detroit uh, with police escorts in and around the city, the minister uh, suggested that Detroit under Chief Craig could become a model city for police community relations. Uh, certainly anybody who knows anything about the Nation of Islam and the rebuilding of the Nation of Islam under Minister Farrakhan knows that we have a long history of being a peacekeeping force in crime-ridden areas in the black community. We are a mainstay in the hood all over America. And one of the most famous episodes uh, in the minister's record uh, and work is when in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, members of the men's class of the Nation of Islam, known as the Fruit of Islam, organized an unarmed force of brothers to go into Mayfair mansions and other public housing complexes in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they helped to bring peace. They helped to end drug sales. They helped to end violence in public housing complexes all over America. And so in many ways, the minister uh, has been something of a sheriff, if you will, uh, in helping to end crime and violence uh, without a budget, uh, without arms, uh, but just with respect for the citizens of the community, love for our people, we've been able to do uh, with hardly any resources uh, what many agencies around the country have not been able to do who have bottomless uh, budgets, if you will. And so uh, it's unfortunate that the sheriff uh, would say that the minister uh, would be a son of Lucifer. Uh, the work of the minister is clear. He's been a redeemer. Uh, he has brought many wayward uh, black brothers and sisters from a path and a lifestyle of self-destruction. And now he has made us into statesmen. He has made us into diplomats. He's made us into dignitaries. He's made us the kind of men and women that other men and women of renown would love to do business with, would love to uh, have as a part of their organization and a part of their companies and a part of the good works that they are involved in. He has really been a reformer. He's been a redeemer of black men and women growing up uh, in a hostile environment where crime and drugs are rampant, where racism and uh, many institutions uh, that promote the idea of white supremacy and black inferiority uh, have inundated black life in America. We come to Minister Farrakhan oftentimes broken. We come to Minister Farrakhan oftentimes damaged. We come to the minister dispirited and despondent, uh, filled with self-hatred. But after we listen to his message and we internalize the principles of his teachings, we begin to become renewed and we become restored. And some have argued that the impact of Minister Farrakhan on the lives of his students and followers is reminiscent of what they describe in the scriptures, wherein it says, and we become new creatures in Christ. And so uh, you can even go in social media and many brothers and sisters are so proud of their transformation uh, that they offer before and after photos uh, showing what we were before and what we are now after we've come under uh, the guidance and wisdom of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, not only did Sheriff Clark mention that he thought the minister uh, should be classified as a son of Lucifer, but he also mischaracterized some of the comments that the minister made back during his Justice or Else tour in the city of Miami when the minister called for 10,000 fearless men and women to become a moral force in the black community all over the country, uh, helping our brothers and sisters learn uh, the very necessary skill of conflict resolution. 
The sheriff uh, falsely said that the minister had asked for 10,000 black men to kill 10,000 white men. And this is 1,000% uh, false. Uh, no, the minister said in a moment of the passion of his message that if we are continued to be slaughtered and murdered in the black community, that we must find the strength uh, to kill those who kill us. Now, what's intriguing about the minister's comments that are born out of the pain of mothers who are bearing their sons and daughters who have been killed in the two front war that the black community is in on one front. We certainly have uh, the unjust and the extrajudicial killings of, of black men and women by uh, law enforcement officials around the country. But the other front of the war is the internal uh, violence of black on black crime, uh, gang violence, domestic violence. So there's a two front war. And the minister has said that we must find the strength to put an end to this, even if it includes retaliation. Now, the sheriff has sought to uh, take issue with the minister's comments, but uh, several years ago in an interview with the National Review magazine, the sheriff talked about how he was reluctantly dragged into becoming a supporter of the Second Amendment and a champion uh, of gun rights in this country. And he said that he became such a strong proponent of the Second Amendment after his own study of black history. And he specifically highlighted Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Thomas Sowell, and the history of black people retaliating against those evil forces that had visited the black community seeking to rape, rob, and lynch us. And he said essentially that when black people began to arm themselves and fight back against those who were our lynchers and tormentors, he said it was only after that that we could really enjoy freedom in this country. And so we say to Sheriff Clark that he should, as a man of principle, sit down and dialogue with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan about better ways for police and community relations to exist on a basis of mutual respect, honesty, and an appreciation for the facts and an appreciation for the truth. Okay, excellent. And also, I want to ask you about this as well. We all know that Cheryl Clark is also a well-known supporter of Donald Trump. We recently also had uh, the brother of Mega Evers, Charles Evers, mm -hmm. down in Jackson, mm -hmm. come out in support of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I, my understanding, the minister also supports Donald Trump. Well, the minister does not support Donald Trump. <laughs> the minister has not endorsed <laughs> Donald Trump. But the minister, you know, one of the things that people, uh, I think, uh, are taken aback when they hear the minister is that the minister represents something that is unusual in America today, something that is becoming more and more increasingly rare. And that is a man who is able to be a critical thinker and to be able to view events and persons and issues and delineate between that which he agrees with coming from that person and that which he disagrees with coming from said person. The minister said on WVON on the Cliff Kelly show that if Donald Trump is elected, uh, he could very well take America into the abyss of hell. Uh, that's on the negative side. On the positive side, the minister has uh, acknowledged that Donald Trump has become increasingly popular and magnetic uh, to the degree that he has been free of any uh, control based upon those who normally control politicians and elected officials due to their donating large sums of money to their campaigns. So, so far, Mr. Trump has uh, funded his own campaign. He's not received money from special interest groups. He certainly has not received money from the Jewish community. He's not received uh, money from traditional sources. So the minister has identified him as a man who has the ability to speak freely and speak independently, even if what he's saying many of us disagree with. And we certainly would disagree with many of the things that Mr. Trump has said with respect to the immigrant community. We certainly would disagree with things that he has had to say about the Black Lives Matter movement. We certainly would disagree with things that he has said about our Mexican brothers and sisters 
And so we can agree to disagree and we can see Mr. Trump certainly as a force in America and we can acknowledge his positive attributes as the minister has done and the minister has also identified and acknowledged those negative aspects of his candidacy. Well said. And also, I know the minister talked about in years past about Barack Obama being selected, not elected. So if we face this 2016 election, uh, is it fair to say that black folks cannot be, they can't be liberated or saved by politics as it stands? I think that's a fair statement, Brother Ronald. Uh, as you know, for many years in the nation of Islam, we have uh, taken the viewpoint that uh, our problem, our condition uh, is so formidable, is so chronic, is so severe that, as the minister said during Savior's Day, Savior's Day address in Detroit two weeks ago, mm -hmm. that our problem necessitates and requires a divine solution. Now, when we consult some of the most popular sacred texts of the world, namely the Christian Bible and the Islamic Holy Quran, we find that when there were people in a similar state or condition as black people are in America today, where we have been slaves in America for more than four centuries, we have been the recipients of slavery, suffering, and death, and we have been all but destroyed and damaged as a people, the divine solution in those instances when we read the sacred texts of the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews was that those people who had suffered that kind of enslavement, that kind of suffering and torment, God decreed that they were to be given their own land, their own territory, their own nation. And so we don't believe that there is necessarily uh, the salvation of black people coming through politics. Politics has its value, it has its place, but for too long in America, we have been led into something that has been termed by the great uh, writer and scholar Harold Cruz, uh, who wrote The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And he talked about how the black struggle had been compromised due to the promotion of this idea of non-economic liberalism. In other words, our leaders uh, were steered in the direction of the ballot box uh, instead of being steered in the direction of economic development and empowerment. Uh, now, when we look at those in the Jewish community, when we look at those in the Chinese community, when we look at all of the various immigrant communities in America, they are powerful. When candidates seek uh, elected positions, they court these immigrant communities seeking their vote and they make promises to them based upon an agenda that these communities have uh, delineated that is in their best interest. But if you'll notice, they never picket, they never protest, you don't really hear much about their political activism. No, they come and they build economic strength. They build uh, what you would call interdependent communities. They build ethnic enclaves. They build strong and vibrant neighborhoods within the major cities of America where they are part of the dominant society, but they can always retreat to their own ethnic enclave, a place where their values, their folkways, their mores, and their norms our mainstays. And so these kinds of people have not been led by the idea of non-economic liberalism and they are respected, they are powerful, they are separate but yet a part of the American landscape. And so the ethnic enclaves is something of a model that the black community, black community should study and begin to implement. As the minister said to us during his Savior's Day address, we must now follow the command and the instruction that really is coming to us from God through Minister Farrakhan that we must make our communities safe places to live. Uh, it doesn't matter what laws are signed. It doesn't matter who occupies the Oval Office or the state legislature or the state governorship. Uh, the black community's problems will be solved by ourselves 
our own efforts, our own unity, our own protecting of one another, respecting of one another, uh, as well as the help uh, and the guidance and the nurturing of our creator. So I don't believe that politics uh, is the ultimate solution to our problem. We've tried political solutions for way too long. We must now seek some of the strategies that we find written and documented in the sacred text, the scriptures, as well as those that we see implemented by other respectable communities, uh, namely the immigrant communities, as they have built ethnic enclaves in and around America. I guess this will sound redundant to a certain degree. I want to ask you about uh, the Obama presidency. Sure. What Did it hurt or help black people in the long run or short term, short term and long run? Well, I think that history uh, will write that our president uh, was one of the most effective presidents in the history of America. Mm -hmm. But we cannot dismiss that the condition of the black community has become progressively worse. Now, I don't lay that at the doorstep, excuse me, of the president, but it could be laid at the doorstep of all who thought and believed that the election of a black president was the creme de la creme, the ultimate achievement of the civil rights movement and a panacea that would solve all of the problems in black America. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan instructed us not long after President Obama came into office that he was not to be viewed and perceived as the black president. He said, no, he was the president of the entire country. But it was incumbent upon all of us in the black community, the leadership in the black community, pastors, imams, clergymen, uh, community leaders. It was incumbent upon us to continue to do the work that we must do in our own communities that even if the president had helped to create a climate in the country that we could benefit from, it was still up to us to do what we needed to do, to do what all self-respecting and industrious and independent people do, which is to make our community safe places for us to live. So history will best be the judge of President Barack Obama's uh, two terms in office, but many writers have already suggested that when you put him on the scale pound for pound, that he has been an effective president but certainly you and I, Brother Ronald, and other conscientious and concerned brothers and sisters have much work to do to awaken uh, the sleeping masses of our people. And so I think that as President Obama leaves office, I think the black community will awaken to the conditions on the ground in black America. And we will hopefully see the urgency of the time, that it is a time for our unity. We must rise above the petty and artificial differences that separate us along religious lines. We must rise above the petty and artificial differences that separate us ideologically speaking, politically speaking. It's time for us to unite and to make our community safe places to live. That's excellent. So I actually this too as well. We had, I mean, it's like a pop culture, like current event thing. The sister Melissa Harris Perry, we had a show on MSNBC, mm -hmm. and people I know said that they're getting rid of their quote unquote Negro whisperers, like a lot of the black media personalities who have made their bones during the Obama administration are now leaving the airwaves. And I just want to talk to you about your thoughts about that, and also about the state of black media today. You know, I have uh, been a great respecter and admirer of uh, Sister Melissa Harris Perry. It's unfortunate that she will no longer be a part of uh, the regular scheduled programming there. But we live in a period of time now where really uh, she can create her own platform. And she always had a respectable and an enlightened uh, opinion and viewpoint. Uh, and so I encourage our sister uh, to take some time to reassess, regroup, re-strategize, and to come back before the masses of our people stronger, bolder, even more courageous. 
I think she will find that this uh, situation that she's in now will offer her much more freedom uh, to share and express her views much more candidly and much more forthrightly. Uh, perhaps in the future she might be inclined to interview uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and to share whatever platform she arrives at or creates for herself uh, with him. But uh, yes, uh, this is an intriguing phenomenon uh, that there are those like the Reverend Al Sharpton and Tom Joyner and others mm -hmm. uh, whose time in the limelight under the Obama presidency is ending. And we wish them well, and we hope that uh, they will bring their influence, their talent, and their skills uh, to uh, help us to create a united black front under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It is time for our unity. Uh, we cannot afford disunity any longer. And if you don't mind, you know, I'm a student in the ministry, so my worldview is shaped by my study of scripture and my study of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But my mind certainly goes to Moses, the children of Israel, Pharaoh and their time in Egypt. And when it came time for their deliverance and God wanted to unite them and make them a great people and to make them a nation, uh, they loved their time in Egypt. Uh, they enjoyed many of the things that they had become accustomed to in Egypt, even though they were oppressed. And so at a certain point, the scripture says that the plagues that God had visited upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians, uh, he had begun to allow the children of Israel to experience them as well. And so the scriptures describe fiery serpents. In the King James Version, it mentions cockatrices that they would turn loose on the people of God. And so in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's revolutionary exegesis of scripture, he says that the fiery serpents mentioned in the scripture actually refer to angry white people who were to vex black people during a period of time where we were reluctant to unite and reluctant to come out of our oppressed state. And so many have articulated that the rise in the killing of our people uh, could be uh, God forcing us to do what we would not do uh, before this, which is to unite, which is to go for self, which is to build an independent reality for our people in this country. Excellent. So you have anything you want to close with? Or just thanks and gratitude, appreciation to you, Brother Ronald, and your subscribers for tuning in and watching. Uh, I hope that any who are interested in the controversy between uh, Sheriff Clark, Minister Farrakhan, and the minister's recent statements will visit www.noi.org. You can watch Minister Farrakhan save his day address from Detroit. You can also watch the minister's part two of his address which he delivered at Moss Marion uh, in Chicago just last week. And finally, it would encourage those in the listening audience to participate in your local organizing committee. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in 10, 10, 15 began to create a movement. And even though there are those who have disagreed with some of the strategies of the minister, the minister revealed uh, during his Savior's Day address uh, some of the facts of a, a recent Rasmussen report that said that there now appears to be a mind among black people in this country to withdraw from many of the traditional Christmas holiday spending patterns. And so the ministers call for an economic withdrawal during the Black Friday and Christmas holiday season proved to be quite effective. And if you watch his Savior's Day address, he goes into detail regarding that. But now all of the local organizing committees are moving on to phase two of our economic withdrawal. We withheld our economic support from many uh, of the entities in corporate America during the Christmas season. And now we are seeking out black businesses to invest in. And some of the local organizing committees 
are having what they call Black Mob Mondays or Black Mob Fridays where black businesses are identified and all of the members of the LOC and then we encourage all of the black people in a particular area to go and shop with our entrepreneurs, our vendors, our business people. It is time for us to unite. It's time for us to become an economic power inside of America. It's time for us to circulate our dollars uh, many, many more times than we have been circulating them in the black community. It's nation time, brothers and sisters. It's nation time. So again, Brother Ronald, thank you so much for this privilege, this honor, and this opportunity. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. And Brother Demetri, and the words are great to go to him. We love you madly. Keep on producing the pleasure. Thank you, Brother.